How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Friends, welcome again to another evening at Millennium of Prophecy, and I'm glad that you've chosen to join us here in Manhattan, and you may be sitting at home on your couch, you may be at a church, you may be at a center, even at a stadium far away from us, but we are so glad that the number one priority on your schedule tonight is to join us here for another exciting evening as we continue in our journey through the scriptures. Well, friends, join with me as we have often done. Let's welcome Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good evening. Welcome again to the Millennium of Prophecy, friends. We have a very exciting Bible study prepared for you tonight from our Historical of Prophecy series. And this weekend, in particular, is going to be one of the high points in the whole seminar. I'm going to ask if Mrs. Batchelor will come out now and join us. And uh, we're going to have our Bible question time. Uh, one of the most um, pleasurable parts of the program for me is the Bible question time, but it's also frustrating because we always have hundreds more questions than we're able to cover. And we'll do our best to be respectful and thorough and still get as many as we can. And so that's our goal. All right, are you ready to start with questions? You done? I'm done now. Ten seconds up. Okay, I'm ready then. Okay. Who are the 144,000? Are they all Jews or spiritual Israel? This comes from Bernard from South Africa. Okay. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. Okay. Some people are upset when they hear what I'm about to say. Now, I probably am about as best suited as anybody to say it being Jewish. The 144,000, I do not believe, are all literal Jews. There may be some Jews among them. Let me give you some scriptures. The Bible says, he that is Christ's, he is Abraham's seed. The New Testament tells us that it is not circumcision in the flesh, but it is circumcision of the heart. Amen. Paul says, he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And so... The 144,000, and if you know your Bibles, you know that in the Old Testament, when King Hezekiah was on the throne of Judea, the king of Israel, the northern empire, the ten tribes, they were conquered by the Assyrians, all carried away captive. They basically intermarried with the Assyrians, and many of them became, they blended in with the people, and very few of them remained a distinct tribe. You all may have some... DNA from some of the lost tribes of the house of Israel. And so to say that they all had to be pure blood, pure blood members of Manasseh and Issachar and Zebulun and, and Naphtali, that's not what it's saying in Revelation. It's saying the 144,000 are composed of people who are part of spiritual children of Abraham. They are spiritual Jews, which means it may be you, it may be me. And uh, so we'll talk more about that. But uh, remember what I told you? The new covenant is made only with the house of Israel. Any Christian who wants to be saved spiritually becomes adopted into the family. That's what Paul says. We are grafted in. The Gentiles are grafted into the stock of Israel. You become a spiritual Jew. So you may be among the 144,000. Well, also when it talks about the 144,000, it asks, are they all virgins? Because it talks about that. Now, when you read in Revelation, that's a good point. When you read in Revelation, you'll find that there is a battle raging between two women. Have you ever done a study on two women in the Bible? Very interesting. You got the two wives of Jacob that are striving over babies, baby boys. You've got the two women who came to Solomon striving over a baby boy. 
You've got Hannah and Peninnah, the two wives of Elkanah, striving over children. You've got Sarah and Hagar striving over the baby boys during a famine. If you've read in 2 Kings chapter 6, two women are striving over which baby boy they're going to eat. You've got all these stories in the Bible about these women that are battling. Then you get to Revelation, there's two women striving. One of them is about to give birth to this man-child. The other, and the devil, is trying to devour the child as soon as it's born. There's a battle between two women in Revelation. One is the church of God. She's true, like Hannah and uh, many of the others that we named. The other is a counterfeit. And the Bible is telling us that the 144,000 are not defiled with the false doctrines of Babylon and her daughters. We've got some lessons that are coming on that, but that's enough for now. All right. If the dead don't go to heaven until the resurrection, why did Jesus tell the thief on the cross that he, the thief, would be with him, Jesus, in heaven in today? Paradise. In paradise That's today, right. I'm sorry. Now, incidentally, those of you who are participating in the seminar, this is in your lesson. And I also want to remind those who may have bumped into the program, you can download each day's lesson right off the Internet. We're not hiding them from anybody. And so if you don't uh, have the resources to order a set of lessons or... Uh, you know, the people who are supplying the lessons, their phones are absolutely jammed right now. So the lessons are on the Internet, and you can download it. Your lesson has a supplement that talks about the, what Jesus said to the thief on the cross. Now, you remember the story, it's in the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus was crucified between two thieves, one on the right and one on the left. Those two thieves represent all of humanity. They both wanted to be saved. One will be saved, one will be lost. One believed. One said, if you're the Son of God. What does if mean? No faith. Remember when the devil came to Jesus, he said, if you're the Son of God. If will not save you, friends. The just shall live by faith. We are saved by grace through faith. You must believe, right? Amen. But the other one said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, even though he had his hands nailed to the cross, the devil could not keep him from saving he instantly shunned his own suffering, and he said to that thief, Verily I say unto you, today you'll be with me in paradise. A lot of people say, well, that's clear enough, Doug. That day he was going to his reward with Jesus. Keep in mind, friends, that in the original Greek, there is no punctuation. The translators in the King James Bible had to decide, where do we put a comma? Do we say, verily I say unto you, comma, today you're going to be with me in paradise? Or verily I say unto you today, comma, you're going to be with me in paradise. Makes a big difference where you put the comma. It's like this man who had a wife a long time ago before they had telephones, but they had Western Union, you know. She went for her birthday over to Europe, and she was in France. She sent a telegram and said, found beautiful fox coat, would like to buy it for my birthday, $2,000. Now, you used to pay by the letter back then, so they made the, the messages very short. He wired back, no price too high. So she bought this fox coat and came home. He met her when she got off the ship, and she's wearing this fox coat. She says, what do you think? And he flipped out. He said, I told you no, price too high. <laughs> there was no punctuation in the message, and she thought he said, no price too high. Very magnanimous, you know. And he said, no, price too high. So you can get the complete opposite meaning by where you put the comma. Now, they put the comma in the wrong place. You're saying, well, that's easy for you to say, Pastor Doug. How do you know that? When you read your Bible, you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. It says that after Jesus rose from the dead, he said to Mary, she went to worship him, she grabbed his feet. The King James Version says, do not touch me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. It actually reads, do not detain me or do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. How could the thief be with Jesus on Friday in paradise if Jesus had not yet gone to paradise? And the Bible says the Father is in paradise. Christ said, I have not yet ascended to my Father. So it would, it, obviously, what Jesus was saying to the thief is, I am telling you today. Now that's really the way it ought to read. Think about that. Everybody around the cross, including his own apostles, had lost faith. They said, we thought he was the one that would deliver Israel. But here, this thief says, Lord, he called him Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He said, you're a king, you've got a kingdom, and you're Lord. Look at that incredible faith. Did Jesus look like a victorious king that day when he hung there naked on the cross? 
He said, I'm making a promise to you today. I don't look like I'm a winner today. I don't look like I have a king or I'm a lord, but today I'm telling you, you will in the future be with me in paradise. You got it? That's what he's saying. And that's also a supplement in your lesson. All right, our last question. 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Does this prove the disciples kept Sunday? Oh, I hope I have enough time to cover this one. Turn quickly in your Bibles. Uh, this is a, probably the last scripture that will come up. I told you we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as possible on the Sabbath truth. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. You can read verse 1 and 2, and that's page uh, 1689 in the Seminar Bibles. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do you. There was a famine in Jerusalem. Paul was making a quick trip to Jerusalem, bringing funds to relieve the members of the church that were starving from the famine. And he says, on the first of the week, remember the word day is not in there, on the first of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no collections when I come. Now, is this saying that this is a church service? Or is Paul saying, on the beginning of the week, after you've been to church and you've given your tithes and offerings and your accounts are in order, we're asking for an additional separate offering that will not be received in church. Lay it by him. What does by him mean? At home. That there be no corporate collection when I come. That I can grab it and run because there's an emergency in Jerusalem. Is this telling us that there was a special religious service that the disciples were gathering on the first of the week? Or he's saying, gather it on the first of the week at home. And so, no, this is not, if you're going to use this scripture to say this proves now the disciples were keeping a new Sabbath day, that God had changed one of the Ten Commandments, uh, that would be building on the sand, in my humble opinion. Well, we went out on the streets again. <laughs> Get a little uh, feedback on our subject tonight, which uh, is a, uh, it's a, it's a very sober subject, a very important thing to understand on people's concept of the punishment of wicked, of the wicked. We are studying Revelation, and Revelation and Daniel touches quite a bit on the judgment and the reward of the wicked and the lake of fire. And so we thought we'd get some idea of what do people think about hell? What is their concept of hell? What is hell like? Now let's find out what kind of responses we get. I mean, I think that hell would more like be like, you know, your worst day on earth. You know, like where everybody's like just horrible and you're like a slave. I don't think it's like some burning flames and stuff like that. I think hell on, it's like hell on earth. Whatever your worst day, the worst time, the depression, they, you know, the worst falling out you've ever had, hell is probably like that. It's probably a torture for you constantly. Um, I don't, my religion doesn't believe in hell. We believe in a cleansing process that each person goes through, but it's uh, everybody goes to heaven. I don't believe in a real hell. I think it's just another thing that people worry about. And, and scare other people with. But nothing, I don't think it, it even exists. What hell is like? Ah, quite, quite a bad, bad place, I would say. Uh, where people have to pay for whatever they've done in their main life. Flames, fires, the devil, all of that? No, nah, whatever, it doesn't matter. Electrical shocks or just a fire. Most important that it's a punishment for whatever people were doing wrong. And I think that if you've committed any sins that you will pay for those. I don't know how, but I think that you will. Okay, well, that's just a small sampling of some of the concepts that we have here in Manhattan. And Manhattan often represents uh, the thought of the planet in many respects. We want to find out what the Bible teaches. God does not want us to remain in ignorance on this subject. So please join me as we go to our amazing fact for tonight, dealing with Mount Vesuvius and Pompeii. Now, I have actually been to uh, Mount Vesuvius, and I've been to the ruins of Pompeii. It's been many years ago. Some of you read the book, When I Sailed Around the Mediterranean Ocean. Our boat stopped here, and we went on a tour, and it was really something to see the discoveries they had found. You see, Pompeii was a resort town that it actually dated back to about 80 B.C. It sort of became the Las Vegas for the wealthy Romans, and it became a, a famous resort. It was at the base of an active volcano. They used to have occasional earthquakes, but in 79 A.D., the town of Pompeii and Herculeum 
were utterly destroyed by a major eruption, something like what happened when the top of Mount St. Helens blew off. The top of the mountain blew off. It buried the city with wet ash, which managed to sort of hermeneutically seal the whole city. And it was basically left untouched till about 1748 when they began some excavations and they found remarkable uh, coliseums and buildings and facilities and homes and dwellings that had been preserved uh, almost perfectly because they had been sealed like this for so long. Among the things they found were these cavities and every now and then they would pour some plaster of Paris in the cavity and they found that what had happened in many cases is people, when they died and the bodies decomposed, it left this chamber and they could find people in the very forms that they had died. 2,000 people perished in Pompeii. There were some very um, tragic scenes of people who died em embracing each other. There were gladiators that died chained so that they wanted to escape or commit suicide. Many of the people escaped. One of the amazing facts that a lot of folks are unaware of is that the Roman legion that had been principally responsible for the destruction of Jerusalem and the leveling of the temple. They'd worked under the general Titus, who later became emperor for two years and then he died, were vacationing in Pompeii when it exploded and many of them perished there. The city was turned to ash. The hot ash came down and it consumed the people. And that I thought would be a fitting, amazing fact to segue into our study for tonight, dealing with cities of ash. Let's go to question number one, and uh, then we'll sort of set the tone for what we're learning from God's Word tonight. Oh, wait, first we need to do the historical. The Bible tells us in our historical that you find in the leading of your lesson that Lot had some shepherds and herdmen, and Abraham, his uncle, had herdmen, and they lived together. And for a while, everything went along okay. But then, because they continued to prosper, the herdmen of Lot and the herdmen of Abraham began to argue. Abraham was very generous, and he said to Lot, Look, the whole land is before you. We want to stay friends. We're family. You take your possessions and your sheep and your shepherds, and you go whichever direction you want, and I'll stay out of your way. You take first choice. Where do you want to go? Now, Lot was the young nephew. He should have given preference to his um, uncle Abraham. But uh, he was coveting the best for himself, I guess. And he noticed back then the valley of Jordan, the plain there, was just a luxurious, the Bible says it was like the Garden of Eden. It was one of the lowest places on earth, but I guess it had a tropical climate back then. And he said, I'll go down to the valley there, the Jordan Valley. And uh, that was not a good choice because the Bible tells us that the people who lived down there were great sinners before the Lord. The men of Sodom were wicked, Genesis 13, 13. Sinners exceedingly, the Bible tells us. And it wasn't just sexual immorality. You can read in Ezekiel about their abundance and their luxury and the idleness and, and the pride was one of the principal sins. Well, God was preparing to destroy those cities. And before God destroys, he wants to save as many as he can. Before the flood, Noah warned the people. Before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he also sent two angels to find out if people would believe in God and accept the warning. But there was only found one man, Lot, and his little family that still believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The angels came and they gave a warning. First of all, the people of the city tried to attack and assault them. And the angel said to Lot, Escape for your life. Look not behind you. Look not behind you. Escape to the mountains, lest you be consumed. What was going to happen to those that remained behind? They were going to be consumed. Lot wanted to try and save as many of his family as he could. And he went to his daughters, who had married some of the gentlemen there in Sodom, and he asked them to come. He said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. You know, and that's still the case today. You tell people the world is not going to last forever. We need to prepare for the end. And remember, I've never told you the end is coming January 1, or I'm not setting a date, but I believe it is coming. The Bible tells us that. Amen? Amen. And most of the world, they laugh. It's a big joke. They mock. That's what the sons-in-law did to Lot. Finally, when it didn't look like Lot was going to make it out in time. The angels in desperation actually took hold 
on Lot and his wife and his two daughters and escorted them physically out of the city to save them and said, flee to the mountains lest you be consumed. And they made it out just in time. The Bible tells us, then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And those cities were devoured. Abraham looked from the hills and it says he could look toward Sodom and Gomorrah and lo, the smoke of the country went up like the smoke of a furnace. It was a supernatural event. God intervened to destroy those cities. The Bible says, but Lot's wife, the reason you need to pay attention to this is Jesus speaking about the end of the world. It says, remember Lot's wife. Lot's wife, her heart was yearning maybe over family, maybe over her furniture, her possessions, her comforts. She was fleeing to the mountains. She did not heed the warning to look not back. You know, Jesus said the day is coming when we will need to flee. He said when the abomination of desolation takes position, we will need to not even return back to the house for our jacket or our things. Don't look back, but head for the hills. There's going to come another time when God's people are going to flee. And he said, don't look back. We need to make sure our treasure is in heaven and not back in Sodom. Amen? Amen. Lot's wife looked back and she turned into a pillar of salt. And Lot and his daughters were the only ones who escaped into the mountains. They thought the whole world had been annihilated. It was actually just Sodom and Gomorrah, but it seemed so intense to them. They didn't think there was anyone left. A little amazing fact for you. There's somebody in the Bible who had children that were also his grandchildren. That's Lot. Lot then had children by his daughters. They were his children and his grandchildren. Their names were Edom and Moab. Ammon, I'm sorry, Ammon and Moab, and they ended up becoming enemies of God's people. The Bible tells us in our first question that what happened then to those cities of the plain is historical. It's an illustration of what we can expect in the future, how God is going to deal with the wicked. All right, here we go now. I tried to jump the gun, but let's get to question number one. What two cities are given as an example of the destruction in, of the wicked in the Bible? Remember, you at home, you here in Manhattan, please call out the answers with Pastor Doug. I like to hear the echo. Turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes and consume and condemn them with an overthrow. Turn them into what? He turned them into ashes. Furthermore, we read, making them an ensample, and that means an example, unto those that after should live ungodly. Right now, if we dismissed the service, if we were to leave, you would have the Bible concept of how he's dealing with the wicked. He said, Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of what God is going to do with the wicked. Fire came down out of heaven. They were consumed. They were turned into ashes. They're an example of how God is going to deal with the wicked. But we're not going to dismiss service now. We're going to go on and give you a lot more information. Question number two. When will the wicked be destroyed in hellfire? The Bible tells us, the Lord knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. How to do what? To reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. They're being reserved. Furthermore, you can read the second part of the answer. Jesus said in John 12, 48, the word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now, friends, I want to go to the Bible quickly. I, you know, I read all these scriptures out of the lesson. I like holding the book. I'd like to show you something. Turn in your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 6. I wanted to read some of this last night. My problem is I have far more scripture than time to share the scripture. People who think you die and go right to heaven before judgment, before the resurrection, they need to read what Jesus says just in this chapter. For instance, page 1558 in the Seminar Bible, John, chapter 6, verse 39. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise it up again at the last day. You read here verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that sees the Son that believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up as soon as he dies. No, I'll raise him up at the last day. You can read verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the 
last day. I'm not done yet. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Just wanted to make it really clear because last night's study dealing with the dead and when they're resurrected and the subject of hell, it's very important for you to know when do people get their rewards so we'll know if people are burning in hell now. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, let's start with verse 22. That's page 1687. For as in Adam all die, we all have the sinful nature we inherited from Adam, but thank goodness we through Christ can get the victory over that. But every man in his own order, oh, I'm sorry, in Christ shall all be made alive. Verse 23, but every man in his own order. Here is the order. Christ the first fruits, Jesus rose already. Afterward, what? Afterward, they that are Christ, when? At his coming. When are they going to rise? The last day. Afterward, at his coming, when the trumpet blows, when the Lord descends, is it clear to you they're not risen yet? Say amen if you understand that. Amen. The Bible is so full of scripture on this subject, it's a tragedy that people take a couple of obscure, vague scriptures and they build a whole theology out of these things. If you just read the Bible, this is what the Christians believe for millennia. The stories in the Bible and the parables that Jesus shares are one of the best ways for us to learn. John Smith, is he in his reward now? Is he in heaven singing? Is he in hell burning? What does the Bible say? He is reserved until the judgment for the last day. Whether he's going to be punished or whether he's going to be rewarded, it's the last day. Is that clear? Now, there's a parable that I want to draw your attention to. You can find in Matthew 13, verse 40 approximately. Jesus talked about a man who had a field and he put good seed in the field. He planted wheat. But an enemy came and he sowed, he planted tares. That's like a weed. When it's small, it resembles wheat. When everything sprouted, the servant said, look, we found that there are tares among the wheat. Do you want us to go pull it up? He said, no, let it grow together till the harvest time. Revelation, Jesus is seen coming with a sickle to harvest the earth, okay? It says, then at the end, we'll do the harvest. Now, you can read here in Matthew 13, verse 40 to 42, Jesus says that this is how it's going to be with the wicked at the end of the world. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and it says, they shall gather them which do iniquity and cast them into a furnace of fire. All right, did you catch that? When are they gathered and burned? The end of the world. This is what Jesus said. So, who is burning in hell now? All right, now I've got to stop and talk to you for just a minute, and I need both of my hands to talk. There are two extremes that people err on when it comes to the subject of hell and the lake of fire. One extreme is that God is a tyrant that as soon as people die, they are plunged into this molten lake of fire and brimstone and the devil's in charge and he has a pitchfork to keep pushing you under to make sure you get cooked evenly. And people are writhing and shrieking and screaming in unutterable agony through ceaseless ages, blistering in molten fire and brimstone. There's a sermon that Jonathan Edwards used to preach called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he would preach with such verbal power that people in the pews would fall down on their knees and say, Please, Pastor Edwards, no more. We can't take it. Have mercy on us. Then the other extreme is, you heard some people here in Manhattan echo, God is love. We're all going to make it. There is no punishment for the wicked. Between those two extremes, you'll find the Bible truth. The Bible does teach there is what we commonly think of hell or a lake of fire where the wicked will be punished, every man according to his works. But the Bible says it is not burning now because the judgment has not taken place yet. The resurrection has not taken place yet. That's actually good news. Amen? Amen. And furthermore, the wicked do not burn in that lake of fire forever. Now, you say, well, Doug, doesn't it say forever? Yeah. Stay with me. We're going to look at every scripture, and I invite all of your questions on this subject, but let's look at what the Bible teaches and believe the Word of God. That sound fair? Yes. Question number three. If the wicked who have died are not in hell yet, where are they? Answer, John 5, 28. 
The hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Then you can go to Job 21, verse 30 and 32. The wicked is reserved to the day of destruction. It goes on to say, he shall be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. Now, what happens when Jesus comes back to the wicked? Bible tells us that the wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. The wicked who are alive when Christ comes back are killed by the brightness of his coming. They stay dead until the end of the 1,000 years. You read Revelation chapter 20. It says, The dead in Christ rise first. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. The rest of the dead, if the righteous and the blessed and the holy are in the first resurrection, who are the rest of the dead? The wicked, obviously, right? They remain in the graves until the thousand years are finished. It says they don't live again until the thousand years are finished. We'll talk about that more this weekend when we study the subject of the millennium. Number four, what is the reward or the punishment for sin? This is something we need to understand. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, God evicted them from the Garden of Eden. And you remember what the Lord said? Put out the man, put a flaming sword with an angel there to guard the way to the tree of life, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. God was saying he was not going to let man live forever. The foundation of many false religions is that you are immortal. You can't die. You're going to live forever in hell. You're going to live forever in heaven. The Bible tells us there are two options, life or death. And death means death. People refuse to accept that, that they've got an end. Question number five, what are the only two choices? This is what we just discussed. What are the only two choices for all men? Answer, John 3:16 that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Friends, the two options are perish or everlasting life. A lot of people believe that you've got everlasting life. You just need to decide whether you're going to spend it in the fire or spend it in heaven. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible, when describing the penalty for sin, it says that the wicked will consume, they'll be devoured, They'll be destroyed, they'll perish, there'll be no more, and I could go on and on and on. You read the hundreds of statements in the Bible, it's very, very clear. And I know you're thinking, but what, what about this verse? And we're going to get to that. Stay with me. Here is one of the most important points that you could get in the whole seminar. What is the penalty for sin? If the penalty for sin is eternal burning, then Jesus did not pay the full price. The penalty for sin is death. Did Jesus die for our sins? He suffered, and the wicked will suffer for their sins and then die. Jesus suffered, and he died. If the penalty for sin is eternal torment, Jesus, he was in the grave, you know, for a couple of days, not forever and ever and ever. But what about, what about those words? Question number six. What will happen to the wicked in hellfire? For yet a little while, say the answers, yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. You know, it even says that about the devil. It says, he will never shall thou be anymore. That's good news that the devil won't be there, make his break from top security torment. No more devil. Never shall thou be anymore. It says, for yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. But the wicked shall perish into smoke. They shall consume away. Now, does that sound clear? I mean, what words would you use to be more vivid than God is using? Is there some words that the Lord is leaving out? No. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1 and 3, speaking of what happens to the wicked, the day that comes shall burn as an oven, and all that do wickedly, how many of the wicked? All that do wickedly shall be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up. And it, they shall tread down the wicked, it says, for there'll be ashes under the soles of your feet. Now, you know, I get excited about this subject. And the reason is, 
When I grew up, I went to 14 different schools. I went to about eight different schools around New York City. And uh, I went to some religious schools. Two of the religious schools told me what a lot of people believe. If you're good and you die, you go right to heaven. If you're bad and you die, you better watch out. You're going to go to hell and you'll burn there and you'll blister through all eternity for the sins of one brief lifetime. And I thought, you know, I'm 10, 11 years old. Doesn't sound fair to me that if I die, I'm going to burn for 10 billion zillion years and then I've only begun. To me, trying to comprehend eternal burning was a shocking thought. I thought God was sadistic. I turned away from God because I had this picture that God was a cruel, sadistic tyrant. And that's when I began to explore these other religions because I thought Christianity, their picture of God, he is a cruel, vengeful, unjust. I could see no justice in it. When I learned the Bible truth on this subject, friends, you have no idea. It was as though a burden had rolled from my shoulders that had been crushing me my whole life. I had this concept of God as cool. Suddenly I could see that God was love and just and merciful when I understood the Bible truth on the subject of hell. That's why this is so important for us to study and to understand. It distorts the picture of God. Now I hope you'll keep your mind open and pray and honestly look at the scriptures. Do not cling to or embrace preconceived ideas because, you know, there's a lot of times people believe things for years and they're just plain wrong. Just because you believe something for a long time doesn't mean it's true. The Bible says there is one truth and the truth will set you free. This subject is one of those cases where when you know the truth, you're going to go, oh, that's so much better. It's so much more reasonable. Jesus says, come now, let us reason together. God wants you to use your head. He is just. Where am I? Question number seven. Number uh, seven. <laughs> Where will hellfire be located? A lot of people are shocked to learn hell is going to burn right here in New York City. That's right. So many people, how many of you have thought hell is this cavern down yonder somewhere? You know, you've all heard that. That comes from Greek mythology. Maybe I should stop right here and give you a little lesson on what the words are in the Bible. There are principally four words that are translated hell. You've got Sheol. It's a Hebrew word. It means the grave. That's what it means. You've got Gehenna. That was a Greek word connected with a Hebrew word for the valley of Hinnom. It was the city dump outside Jerusalem that was full of worms and they kept it smoldering to keep the stench down. You remember when Jesus said, you're better going to heaven missing a hand, a foot, or an eye than going to hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched? The word Jesus used for, was the dump outside of Jerusalem, Gehenna. Okay, there's another word. It's Hades. Hades was a place that came from Greek mythology. Keep in mind, Alexander the Great conquered Jerusalem and Palestine back then. They were well acquainted with the Greek gods and mythology. As a matter of fact, some of the Jews were called Hellenists. They had sort of embraced some of the Greek culture along with Judaism. Jesus talked about Hades. Hades had a god named Pluto who was in charge of this cavernous place where wicked souls were tormented. Have you heard of the hounds of hell? Where's that scripture? That's not from the Bible. The idea that the devil is in charge of hell, it's not in the Bible. Then there's a fourth word which is Tartarus. And it's, it's used one time in the Bible, I think it's uh, 1 Peter, and it simply means a place of darkness, okay? So those are the four words that are translated hell in the Bible. Many times the word hell simply meant the grave. And that's why the writer said down in hell. It meant down in the grave. So people think that hell was down yonder somewhere. I tell you, it's fun walking back from the meetings at night. I forgot how much of New York City is under the street. And, you know, sometimes you see all the steam billowing up out of the manholes. And it looks like hell's down yonder sometimes when you walk back from the meeting at night. But hell is not going to burn down yonder. Hell is going to burn in New York and all around the world. The Bible tells us that the lake of fire rains down on the earth to purify the planet. And that's our next answer. Answer to question number seven. It says, And the wicked went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed, surrounded the camp of the saints about, and God rained fire down from heaven upon them, and it devoured them. 
Now, if you're not sure what the word devour means, you need to invite Pastor Doug over for Mexican food, and I'll explain <laughs> devour. I'll give you a demonstration. Second Peter, I get a lot of free Mexican dinners by making that announcement. Further, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it tells us the elements will melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God is going to use this fire to purify. It's, it does a lot of cleansing. You know, the Bible tells us that God uses fire to purify us. Do not be amazed at the fiery trials that try your faith, knowing that the trying of your faith will make you more precious than gold. The way they purified fine metals with heat, the way you get out the wrinkles. The Bible tells us God is coming for a bride without spot or wrinkle and use a hot iron to mash out the wrinkles. And so God is going to purify us now with sometimes trials and lessons and hard things we go through. But fire also purifies, sterilizes. We know that now. Number eight, will the devil be in charge of hellfire? Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil, answer, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. This idea that the devil's down there checking people into hell, we've all seen the cartoons and comics and the stories. It's not biblical. The devil is going into the lake of fire. So many of these false concepts about hell came from the Middle Ages, and I'll be very honest with you. They were developed for the purpose of scaring people into church and then scaring money out of the people. Did you know that? It was a fear tactic. It wasn't biblical. Let me tell you a little story. One day, Christmas Eve, a Baptist minister and his family, their car broke down not far from our car, uh, from our home. Everything was shut down. We invited them to spend the night. Needed some alternator brushes and the stores were all closed. I said, I'm a Christian. He asked him, what were my beliefs and, and I shared and, and I taught I talked to him about uh, what the Bible says about hell because I was baptized Baptist first when I first came to the Lord. I'm well acquainted with what my dear friends in the Baptist church believe. And I share the scriptures I'm sharing with you. And he said, Brother Doug, I've seen those scriptures before and if you go by the Bible, it does look like the wicked are going to be burned up in hell and it does look like hell is not burning yet. But you know what he said? He said, if I told my church members that, they wouldn't come to church. I said, brother, I hope that's not why they're coming. <laughs> a lot of people, the pastors, you know, this is sort of fire insurance for them. They want to make sure that the people come, and so they use this fear tactic. Does the Lord want us to come because of fear or because of love? It's because of love. You know, there's a lot of people out there that recognize these things. Will the fires of hell ever go out? And then the answer, of course, is there shall not be a coal to warm at, nor a fire to sit before it. You know, I'm not the only one that believes these things. My church, you know I'm a pastor, and I've tried to say very little about my church. I don't know how long I'll be able to control myself. Try not to brag too much about my specific church. I want to go from the Bible, but my church is not the only church that believes this. This is a teaching that is coming back to the Christian faith. There is a minister by the name of Edward Fudge, a charismatic pastor who wrote a book you can find in Christian bookstores. It's sort of turning the... Uh, Christian theology up on its heels, and he's studying this subject. He's saying, if we go by the Bible, it's very clear. The fire consumes the wicked. It devours him. Forward is by F.F. F. Bruce, a great theologian from the Prim Plymouth Brethren. And so this is not something that's being discovered or discussed in a corner. It is a Bible truth that is coming back to the people again. Uh, people are getting away from the fearful medieval traditions and pagan fables and back to what does the Bible really teach about this. Question number 10. Are both the soul and the body destroyed in hell? What does the Bible say? Matthew 10, verse 28. Fear not them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Now, Jesus' body was tortured, but the devil couldn't touch his soul. And you might be tortured, but don't worry. The Bible says, rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, what did Jesus say is going to happen? Both soul and body will be what? Destroyed in hell. That means all that you are, the essence, the mind, the body, the soul, the spirit, it's all destroyed in hell. Never going to be again. Number 11, for whom will hellfire be kindled? 
Who is the Lord doing it for? Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for all the bad people. Who's it prepared for? Prepared for the devil and his angels. The sad thing is, if people choose to follow the devil, they will share his reward. There are only two masters. There's only two roads. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. And if you're against Jesus, you're with the devil, you will share in his fate. God is desperate to save as many as he can from the fire. He loves us. The Bible tells us the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God who would have all men to be saved. The Bible says, for whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. God is giving this message because he wants to save us from the lake of fire. There is punishment for the wicked, and we'll touch on that, but it's designed for the devil and those that follow him. Number 12, how does the Bible refer to God's destruction of the wicked? Isaiah chapter 28, verse 21. It says, The Lord shall be wroth, that he might do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. God is a giver of life. The Lord wants to create life. He's a God of love and blessing. Look at the Garden of Eden if you want to find out what God is like. He made a paradise and he put man in paradise that we might enjoy bliss. He said everything was good, good, very good. If you want to know what God's design is for you, you've got to look back at the Garden in Eden. You need to look ahead at the Garden in the new city, right? God wants you to be happy. When he has to cast the wicked in the lake of fire, do you think he enjoys that? It's, it says, the Bible says it's his strange act. He takes no pleasure at all in the destruction of the wicked. You know, when I lived up in the cave, my cat, cats are a little sadistic when they catch mice. They don't just catch them and take out their fork and knife and eat them. They like to play with their food. And I remember I appreciated that the cat would do that from time to time. Matter of fact, we've got mice in our apartment right now. But we're trying to dispatch them quickly. Well, my cat one time caught a little kangaroo rat while I was cooking my dinner. And they beat it up and then they let it go, let it run and then catch it again. And the poor little dazed creature tried to bolt for freedom and he hopped off into the fire. And it only took, now listen to, listen to the reaction here in Manhattan among all these people. Oh, little kangaroo rat. And you know what? That's how I felt. It only suffered a few seconds, but it seemed like an eternity. And my, I thought, oh, the poor little thing is suffering. It was bad enough when my cat was torturing, but in the fire. I could not bear to see a mouse suffer that way. Do you think that God is going to do that to his rebellious creatures? through all eternity? Stay with me, friends. Number 13. Doesn't the Bible phrase unquenchable fire indicate that the fire never goes out? I mean, it says unquenchable. That means it burns forever and ever. Let's find out what the Bible says. Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. It says, He will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That sounds like a contradiction. Burnt up means all gone, but it says unquenchable fire. Stay with me, I'll explain it. Jeremiah 17, 27. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I'll kindle a fire in the gates thereof and it will devour the palaces of Jerusalem and it shall not be quenched. Here it says devour. There it says not quenched. The palaces and the gates were devoured. They were burnt by Nebuchadnezzar because they did not repent of their sins. They are not still burning today. Unquenchable means it is not extinguished. Another scripture here, Mark 9, 47 and 48. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, for it is better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, let me explain this with an illustration, and I hope this works. I've got a pack of matches here. Please don't contact the fire marshal. I've seen plenty of people smoking around this place. I'm sure I can do this. All right.
Now, the fire is burning. It's not quenched. I'm not going to quench it. It's burning, trust me. I'm not going to quench it. Not going to, ooh, that's hot. Not going to quench it. I'm not quenching it. Not going to quench it. I didn't quench it. Is it burning? No. Quench is a verb. It means to extinguish. It's saying the fires, what's left? Nothing. Ashes. There's nothing left. I did not quench it. No one will be able to extinguish the fires of hell. There will be no fireman in hell running around putting the fire out. That's what the Bible is saying when it tells us that it is unquenchable fire. Okay. Number 14. Doesn't the phrase everlasting fire mean unending? It says everlasting, that means it's going to burn forever and ever. Let's find out. Jude verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt up with eternal fire. Are they still burning today? No. no. I've been to the Dead Sea, the lowest point on earth, and those cities are destroyed. Matter of fact, if you go to the south end of the Dead Sea, there, uh, there's a hilly area there that is just piles of ash, and embedded in the ash are little sulfur balls. I have one of them in my apartment in California, in uh, my house in California, and you can set them on fire and they burn. It's like they're leftovers from the destruction. Only place in the world where you find something like that. Sulfur balls embedded in ash at the south end of the Sea of the Dead Sea. That makes me think that the story is real. Okay, where am I? Number 15? When Revelation 20, verse 10 states that the wicked will be tormented forever and ever, doesn't that indicate endless time? Well, you'd think so. Jonah chapter 2, verse 6. Remember how long was Jonah in the belly of the fish? Three days and three nights. What did Jonah say? The earth with her bars was about me forever. But the Bible says that Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. Now, it might have seemed like forever. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been in that dark, cramped, slimy, stomach acid, that burning? And you know what occurred to me one day that really gave me the creeps? If Jonah was alive in there for three days and three nights, there could have been other creepy, crawly creatures. He could have been in there with squids and sea urchins, and it probably seemed like forever, don't you think? Especially with no watch down there. Seemed like forever. What does the Bible mean when it says forever and ever? Well, you have to read it in its context. In Greek, the word forever comes from the same root word where we get eon, enon. It means an unspecified period of time. You ever said, why well, I haven't seen them in eons? You heard that expression? Well, that doesn't mean I haven't seen them forever. It means it's a long time. And that's how it's going to feel when the wicked are cast into the lake of fire. The Revelation says the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. Remember, ascends up forever and ever means out of sight. We had these city dumps in Texas when I lived there. Every 10 miles, there was a little town, and every town had a little dump, and they used to burn the dumps to keep the stench down. And you could look on burn days as you drove across the panhandle of Texas, and you could see these little pillars of smoke going up out of sight forever and ever. It, they didn't burn up forever and ever, but they went up out of sight forever. See what I'm saying? So you've got to read it in its context. It ascends out of sight. Furthermore, when uh, a Hebrew man had a Hebrew slave, he could serve his master six years. At the end of six years, he was allowed to go free. But if he liked his master, he'd go through a ritual where he would poke his ear to the door of the house, and it says, and he will serve him forever. Well, what did that mean? Till he died, right? First Samuel. Remember when Hannah brought little Samuel to the temple to dedicate him to the Lord. She left him there to remain for how long? Forever. You read a couple more verses and it says, as long as he lives. So how long was forever? As long as he lives. If a person commits a bunch of terrible crimes and murders and the judge gives him a thousand years, you know, some judges do that. They compound sentences to make sure they're not paroled and they give them 50 life terms. You know what they're getting? Eternal punishment. 
They're never getting out. There's no second chance. And this is what God is telling us. That's why he's pleading with us to accept Jesus in these lives that we have that are so short compared to eternity. You've got one life to make a decision because your destiny is eternal. You've got eternal life or eternal death. But not eternal conscious burning. God does not have a torture chamber out there in the universe somewhere where he's going to torment people forever and ever. Forever and ever is a biblical expression that means until the end of the age, not necessarily an infinite period of burning time. All right, question number 16. After sin and sinners are destroyed, what will Jesus do for his people? 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. I especially like this next verse. Revelation 21, verse 4. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes, and the Bible says there will be no more death, neither will there be any sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. God is not going to immortalize sinners. How could you enjoy eternal life if friends or family that you know are lost were burning in the lake of fire? That's a terrible... I asked a man one time who believed that. I said, what, do you, what would you do if, heaven forbid, you're in heaven and your wife is lost and she's burning in the lake of fire. How could you enjoy your reward? And he said, well, I'd just say, praise God. i just <laughs> praise him. His wife looked at him funny, too, when he said that. <laughs> I mean, is God going to erase all natural affection from us? I, 15 years ago, lived way back up in the hills, called this Christian radio program. I was listening as people called in Bible questions. You know, they've got these Bible call-in programs. And this, uh, this woman called. And it was a very, very sober, touching call. She said, Brother so-and-so, my son died in a car accident while drinking a couple of days ago. He made no profession of being a Christian. I need to know, is he burning in hell right now? Well, he tried to evade a direct answer and say, well, God judges these things and I don't want to put myself... She said, no, no, no. Tell me. I need to know. He said, well, if he wasn't saved, the Bible's clear that he goes to hell and he will be tormented forever and you could hear the lady, before he finished, choke and hang up the phone. Immediately after that, a college student, a young lady, called up. She said, Brother so-and-so, I want to believe in God. I want to give my heart to Jesus, but I have a really hard time thinking that I could trust and love a God who is so sadistic and unjust that he'll take these creatures he's created that have a natural propensity to sin anyway, all of us sin by nature when we're born, and then plunge them in a lake of fire for all eternity, for the sins of one brief lifetime. He said, who are we to question God and if you understood how bad sin was? Well, at this point, I'm jumping up and down yelling at my radio in my house, 10 miles away from the nearest telephone. Fortunately, it was a program that lasted more than an hour. I jumped in my car and I raced down these bumpy mountain roads. <laughs> and I prayed as I went. I just, just about killed myself trying to get to town. Went to a friend's house that had a phone. Charged in without even knocking. Said, I've got to use your phone. And I prayed all the way down that I'd get through, and it's always a very busy program, and I prayed that these two ladies would still be listening. I dialed, busy signal. But I don't give up. God wants you to be persistent. I dialed again, and I got through. Amen. And then the man said, stay on the line. Pretty soon the speaker came on and said, welcome to such and such a program. I said, brother so-and-so, I said, I believe the Bible clearly teaches that when a person dies, they sleep until the resurrection, and that nobody is burning in hell until after the judgment, and that they don't burn forever. Can I please share a few scriptures? Thank you very much. And you've got to talk fast, because this guy cuts you off and interrupts you. <laughs> and God has given me that gift, you know. I grew up in New York City. <laughs> and so I just started going, Pfft, and started sharing all these scriptures that say, they'll perish, they'll die, they'll consume, they'll be no more, they'll be burnt up, no more pain. And I gave, and then he's, pretty soon I'm listening on the radio and I didn't hear my voice anymore. And he pressed the mute button and he began to try and straighten things out. And um, he came back and I said, now may I respond to that? He gave the typical things. I said, Sodom and Gomorrah were burnt with eternal fire. They're not burning today. They're ashes and that's what God's going to do with the wicked. And 
He hung up on me. <laughs> I was polite. And you know what I did? I said, Lord, I wish someday I could have a radio program where I could give people the right answers. Amen. And you know, I never dreamed he'd do it. I've got my own radio program now. So anyway, he wouldn't take any more phone calls for the last 20 minutes of the program because what the Bible did was so overpowering that he had no argument for it. Friends, I hope you'll read the additional supplements that are in your lesson, but we need, to, we need to wind this up here. I want you to take a look with me. Question number 17. Will the sin problem ever rise up again the second time? It says, affliction shall not rise the second time. There will never be this danger again. God is not going to immortalize the devil and sinners. If anyone deserves to burn forever, it's Satan, right? And the Bible says in Ezekiel, never shall thou be any more. You will not be. God says, I am, and you will not be. He's not going to be immortalized. He will suffer longer than anyone. Furthermore, friends, the Bible tells us that God rewards everyone according to his works. Isn't that right? There are varying rewards. If everybody goes right to hell and burns forever and ever, that means Adolf Hitler, is, who murdered millions of people, is burning less time than Cain, who murdered one. Would that seem just? No, when you look at these scriptures in the Bible, but if God puts people in the lake of fire and they are punished with different duration or intensity according to what they deserve, there are varying rewards. Some will probably go poof right away because they just, you know, they didn't know much and, and uh, they maybe, you know, uh, didn't get their card punched or whatever. They didn't qualify. But, whereas others will get uh, more punishment based on what they've done. Number 18, what penetrating question does Job ask? Shall mortal man be more just than God? Is there anybody here, if your child was a rebel, disrespectful, cursed their parents, stole your money, and I've met some kids that are like this, would you spank them for a month? Would you spank them for a week? Some parents abuse their children, but they finally get tired, you know? No, you wouldn't do that. Are we more just than God? You know, the Lord wants us to know that he's love, and the truth on this subject will draw us nearer to the Lord. I hope that you'll keep your heart open. I hope you'll pray and listen as John sings this familiar hymn. Can you trust and love and give your heart and soul to a God who is a God of love, who is going to deal justly? He wants you to come to him just like you are that you might live eternally. Nearer, still nearer, close to my Several years ago, our family was driving up our mountain road to the cabin on our ranch. We thought we saw a deer in the road. Turned out that it was a German shepherd, about a year old, someone had abandoned. We tried to do everything we could to coax it to the car, and it was scared. Finally, my oldest boy, Micah, who was about eight years old then, he got out of the car and he got up on his knees and crawled up towards the dog and said, the dog came right to him. He grabbed it, put it in the car, took it home, it had been abandoned, it was hungry. We named him Prince, had him for several years. A good dog, if ever a dog had a good life, he had a good life. Got to run free, nearest neighbor was a mile away, kept the dog food bin full outside, pond to drink from. I mean, that dog had a dog's life. <laughs> a few years ago, he got a disease that German shepherds sometimes get, where he couldn't walk. It was a hip 
disorder. And as he got old and gray, it was very sad to see him dragging around his back legs. And uh, we didn't want to do it, but Micah one day said, Dad, I think I need to take care of Prince. And in an act of love, he dispatched the dog. And it was one of the hardest things he ever did. He loved the dog. It was his dog. When God deals with the wicked, people need to know it's an act of love. Yes. It's an act of mercy. Sinners are not happy. They're miserable in their souls. And God is going to punish them because he's a loving king. He's just, but he's going to burn them up so they don't suffer through e eternity. You can trust your life to a God like that, friends. Amen. You who are watching, friends, do you think that you'd like to say, I want that eternal life? There are only two rewards. You can get what Jesus has. You can live and reign with him, or you can share the reward of the devil. If today you would like to say, by God's grace, I want to follow the Lord. I want to be near him. Is that your prayer, friends? Yes. Would you stand in God's presence and acknowledge that? You at home can stand as well as we close with prayer. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the biblical truth that liberates and sets us free, that you are a God of love, a God of mercy. I pray, dear Lord, that we can understand maybe some of these perplexities that are still unclear. Help us to build on the rock of what the Word says. Most of all, help us to know that you are a just God and a loving Father, and that someday there will be a universe where there is no more pain, sorrows, suffering, or sin. We want to dwell with you there for eternity. Help us walk with you here now is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.